there, YouTubers. How you doing? Mr. Al Bob here. Uh, back in 19... Oh... Late 70s. Um... I was a, you know, a nightclub electrician, master electrician. And, um, mm. I had wired um, a number of, of uh, pretty well-known nightclubs. And the most uh, notorious one that I worked on was a thing called uh, Xenons. And it was one that the mobsters who invested in it, um, they were getting towards the end, they'd spent a lot of money, and the disco was flashing lights and loud music. And if you don't have those, no matter what the ambiance is, it's not working. So they had a lot of stuff, but nothing worked. So they got me in there, and I made it work. I said, you know, pay me this much, and they did, and they never let me out until I got it working. And once I did that, that was like the magic ticket. I worked at a lot of, you know, kamikazes, tunnel club, um, danceateria, uh, mud club, um, all of these different clubs. I was their electrician, and I fixed things more than re you know did the whole job you know i just made it work and i kept bringing things in art shows and and kind of um i had friends who knew everyone and we'd have these parties and it made these clubs the thing so i could walk into any of these clubs and i really liked dance interior because it was an old um back from the 19th century like macy's you know along sixth avenue between um 19th Street and 34th Street. There are all these buildings that were, um, you know, like um, department stores of their time. Yeah. And this building was big open space with elevator, and I think it had six floors. And we put two fire um, exits on either side so people could get out, lots of people could get out. But the real way up and down were these uh, old 19th century um, elevators that were kind of metal uh, Matisse uh, kind of things and these girls um, you know in scantily dressed ran the elevator they weren't push button you had to run it and each floor was a different music one floor was uh, like um, you know um, punk and one was uh, uh, heavy metal and one was this and one was that and um, there was uh, one floor that was kind of a performance art music thing and um, I, went, I was there, and it was interesting, but there, the majority of the people were down in the metal and the punk and the this and the mosh pit. And there was a guy leaning against the wall, and he looked so out of place because he looked like he was straight out of a, uh, um, you know, J. Cruz or uh, even who's the guy who's more uh, 1960s sailboat looking kind of guy. I mean, he had... Duran Duran? Uh, no, 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 Young no, no, Donald no. I'm Trump? Talking about, uh, no. <laughs> I'm talking about fashion designing. No. Uh-oh. Um, well, D Duran Duran was into that stuff. No, nah, no, nah, this was not. No, this was... That this, was later. No, this but, guy was wearing um, a very nice pair of um, linen pants and a very nice shirt buttoned down, and he had a sweater. I mean, he looked like he just came off the tennis courts, and he had very nice coiffure, not too long, not too short, uh, not wildly colored, just a nice kind of um, sandy colored hair and uh, very striking cheekbones and good looking kind of guy. And me, you know, I kind of look like this, a little less me. I mean, you know, I was my late 20s. Anyway, he was the most interesting guy there. And I went over and said, hey, how you doing? What, what are you doing here? He goes, oh, I'm just listening to music. I, I'm in music and I really like music and I'm into performance art and these guys are, came to see these guys. And, eh, I said, yeah, I know it's pretty, nothing's happening here. So I said, so uh, do you live here? He goes, no, I'm just visiting. And I said, so do you want to um, go someplace that you've never been before? And he kind of looks at me like, I said, no, no, it's nothing uh, weird, but it's, it's really, yeah. really going to be interesting. And he goes, yeah. well, I'm game. And it was about eh, 11 o'clock. And we went out on, I guess, I forget.
forget what street it was 21st or it was before 23rd but we went over to uh, Fifth Avenue and we took a cab downtown into Washington Square where NYU is and there's all these coffee houses and also the Man of La Mancha was always playing there in this little theater and um, oh, it'll pop into my head it's not Malibu but it's uh, Mulberry 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 and there was a great coffee shop where if you wanted to uh, uh, a game of good chess you go in there and there was another next to it where if you wanted to hear poetry and it was it was totally beat I mean it was the beat scene and this was like you know 70s and it was still like 1958 and to 1965 it was like a time warp and on the other side of Houston was the other little Italy the west side little Italy hmm. um, that went down to Spring Street and then went all the way over to uh, pass Mercer, and that was Mike Finelli's Little Italy. He was the godfather of that. Anyway, and I was part of all of that. I was living in Soho. I, Mike Finelli, he was my, I was his electrician. Anyway, so I take um, this guy, his name's David, and he didn't want to be Dave. He, you know, I said, so you're Dave? I said, no, I'm David. I said, okay, David. So um, we went down to, um, the, um, it was like the Knights of Columbus, but it wasn't. It was on Mulberry Street, and it was where all the mobsters had their guns, and they had a, you know, where you could shoot your gun. And I didn't take them there, because you had to really be in to get there, but where I did take them was on Washington Square, Mulberry Street, Fifth Avenue, and on the side of where NYU is, there was this parking garage. And most people think a parking garage and it's a spiral thing in the each floor. But this was such, it was just the size of a building. You know, most parking garages take, take a whole block. This thing was just like, you know, uh, 70 feet uh, wide by a hundred and something feet deep. And what it was, was a leftover from the 1920s Frankenstein Otis technology. And you drove your car in there and you got out and the, the guy who ran it uh, gave you a ticket and he pushed a button and it would lift your car up and then over and put it in a space. So if you just had a <coughs> parking lot, maybe you could park 30 cars there. But because it had six floors, you could do six times 30. So you could, you know, park a lot of cars there. And, um, and parking at that part of the neighborhood was very, there wasn't any parking. So, you know, you could make some money. And on top, because this was a mobster thing, on top was a roller rink, right? Cool. And inside the roller rink, the circle, was um, a um, pin alley, meaning not a bowling alley, not the AMF where you have a bowl about this big and the pins are about this big. This were, the bowls were like you could fit in your hand like this and the pins were smaller and instead of having a machine scooping them up and putting them down they had kids back there and you'd throw the ball down knock them down and they, the ones that came down they had this lever that this thing would come down and pick kids the pins. yeah kids how between, old oh between the age of 14 and 20. They were of legal age to work then? No, there was but no. But illegal immigrants? No, no, they were they were kids from the neighborhood. But the thing wow. was, these mobsters, as soon as the kid went like this and returned the ball to the mobster, as soon as he got it, they would throw it. So those kids had very little time to set the, to clean it out and set the ones down. And there was a net where they would dive into. Otherwise, they would get hit by a ball or a pin. And part of the game was to try and hit the kid with a, 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 a pin or a ball and not kill him. You know, maybe break a finger, give him a black eye. And if the kid, and all these kids wanted to do this because the mobsters who were playing this game would give them a, a, a tip, you know? of like a hundred, you know, Benjamin was like this, you know, he just broke a finger, they give you, and this is like 1974 or five, maybe six, eh, five, 75. 
And um, anyway, they thought it was funny to like throw the ball. Yeah, and exactly. Hurt him. And hurt the kid. And the <laughs> kid terrible. would, would really want to get hurt because yeah, yeah, he'd no. get a hundred dollar bill. And if he got hit four or five times, he'd make four or five hundred bucks. Oh, and they liked it. Yeah, it was. I mean, how? What kid of that age yeah, who had yeah. no job okay. whatsoever um, could make four or five hundred bucks in an evening and not go to jail? You know. You think Trump was around back then? Oh yeah, Donnie Did, was, was he throwing balls at him? No, not up there. Or was he, he, he wasn't part was of he the, telling him that's horrible? No, he wasn't part of that was at all. Was he saying that's horrible? But but he no no he would have loved to have done it. God no you know I no have, no. All I know is that Donnie was at all these nightclubs. I couldn't imagine. He may, he might not have. He no, might, he wasn't up there. He might not have liked to hurt people. Donnie was not cool enough to uh, to uh, okay. be up there. Anyway, so I'm up there because I used to. Fix did you ever see Donald Trump? A number of times. At you nightclubs. did. Oh yeah. I saw him you at did? Studio 54. I saw him. Uh, he would be with Roy Cohen all the time. Oh my gosh. And um, yeah, no, I saw him around and. Uh, Back in the day when he first built Trump Towers, uh, I had a girlfriend who was an architect who worked for the firm who built, who designed Trump Towers. And the um, guy who, you know, and the most important thing is the lobby. So she was working on the team of the lobby and the mm. guy who was head of that team, he either got really sick or had a, for some reason, medical reason, he mm. no longer was part of that. And he, he kind of, and so my girlfriend, you know, took over, right? Wow. And at that time I was making art of reflective sources. And I kind of got them into, there's a back wall of the lobby where wow. a waterfall comes down <laughs> and reflects light. And I put a bunch of my little reflector uh, art pieces in the water. And so when that went down and they had the big opening, I did get to meet Donnie, but that guy, he had the attention span of a gnat. I mean, he had a bunch of people with clip, you know, talking and, um, you know, making things happen. And he would, ah, ah, ah. anyway, back to this story. We're back up there and, and the girls in the roller derby were basically uh, you know, exotic dancer girls who liked to roller skate. And they too would get nice tips. And so they were trying to beat the crap out of each other this was a little more hardcore. Um, wow, that was like the original roller derby Not stuff? original, no, but... No. The, 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 they had it before then? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. They had the roller derbies in the 20s and the 30s. Oh, man. Yeah, wow. yeah. No, no. Roller derby's been around. Okay. Maybe even in Rome. But, um, but it was this... Everything was orchestrated for the entertainment huh. of the mobsters. Huh. And the mobsters were like made guys. Huh. And they... This is where they were like children, not children. They're, they're fun, you know, instead of killing people or beating, they were like enjoying this yeah. kind of. Now, I remember they had Spumoni Gardens in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. They you had think that they there. hung out there? Yeah, they, yes. I visited there before. And a few uh, times. they all well, along yeah. um, this street, uh, Mulberry, there were tons of, you know, cafes and, and uh, vegetable stores, and in the back, were um, where the mobsters hung out, where you couldn't go. And on along 8th Avenue, near the bus, uh, Port Authority bus, there were a whole bunch of um, um, vegetable stands that had mobster nightclubs in the back. And that's why, I don't know if you ever saw Goodfellas, and in the scene where our hero brings the, his, his new Jewish girlfriend uh, to this place. And you see him walk through a kitchen and then through a kind of where people are moving pallets and stuff. And then he's, boom, out into this kind of funky room, but all the tables are pristine. And there's Tony Bennett singing. And, you know, they put his, they carry a table in, put it right up in front of Tony Bennett, put a tablecloth, two chairs, the little, um, uh, you know, uh, candle and uh, and drinks and, and sit the girl down. And she's like in awe. Well, that's what I'm talking about. That's what this was like. There was this whole... They just did whatever they want. They had so much power. They yes, did these cool things. they could do things. whatever. There was this one But it was awful, the, 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 you know, hurting people. He used to smoke these cool things called spliffs, which were Cuban cigars with lamb's breath, which is the, the most potent part of, wow. of the cannabis plant of the female bud 
the purple little hairs that are really all just THC. And he'd have these cigars that they would roll it up. So when you smoke these suckers, it was like 80%, um, you know, lamb's breath and 20% of the outside um, roll uh, of really great Cuban tobacco rolled in Cuba. And that's what a blunt was. The, the guys who were um, um, Rastafari, like in Jamaica, you could have marijuana, that wasn't against the law, but having rolling papers wow. was against the law. So they would, these That's blunts amazing. were made up of, you know, uh, they'd have a newspaper, and then they'd have marijuana leaves, and then they'd have bud, and then they'd have lamb's breath, and they'd roll it up, and they'd be like this big, and you'd be smoking, and all you, and because the paper was somewhat moist and the leaves were kind of moist, the only thing that was really dry that burned was that lamb's breath. And so it was like cooled by the cool, moist uh, leaves. And, and that's what these mobsters, meaning they could do anything. The police were on their payroll. They never had to worry about anything except other mobsters shooting them, but not the police. They weren't worrying yeah. about the police, you know? And um, so anyway, this guy, mm. David and I are up there and David is just a gag at everything. You know, he is just watching. And these guys are looking at him going, pretty boy. And they had this kind of, you know, appreciation. And the, he was talking about entertainment and, and art and uh, culture. And they understood what he was talking about. And so did I. But I was going, hmm, look at this. And I was more talking to the girls scantily dressed in roller skates. What year was it? I told you, 1976. Oh. Around 75. But it was before the 200th birthday. I was still living in Mulberry, so well, yeah, it was before probably I was 75, before wow. I met Donna Ann McAdams. Okay. That was 77. Anyway, so we're having an amazing evening, and then, you know, after it gets later than late, the mobster guys, they, they're high on something, so they're not ready to go to sleep. So we trundle down, get in their limo, and we go to one of those restaurants on 8th Avenue where we have lobster tails, the best steak I ever had, bottle of Dawn, and and we're smoking these these uh, you know um, these spliffs like you can't believe. And uh, when we come out, um, the sun is rising. Wow! And uh, we're on the west side on Eighth Avenue, and the sun is rising from the east, so it's coming down the streets and and shining these amazing shadows. And the mobsters go, so where do you boys want to go? And, and Dave says, I just want to take a walk. And I said, sure, let's, let's take a walk. So we first walk over to, and the West Side Highway had already collapsed. And so the whole West Street uh, was kind of funked out. And so we were walking down that. And then around 34th Street, we came back up, went to um, Fifth Avenue, and then walked up towards Central Park where the sun was coming through Central Park and uh, we went uh, he was staying at the um, oh, not the Waldorf Astoria the other one right on the park the, the Tavern in the Green? Uh, no, the, the hotel, big fancy hotel but anyway uh, he went Rockefeller in, Plaza? Yeah Really? No, okay. whatever yeah. that one right on the corner. There's another one like They're that. Right on the that. corner of Fifth Avenue and and um, the Plaza Hotel. That's what it was, the Plaza. The Plaza. The Plaza. Yeah, okay. So, well, uh, we go and we and the uh, the Oak Room is still kind of open, so uh, we get you know espressos and um, some whiskey. To um, I don't know what day it was, like maybe Wednesday or Thursday. Because um, you know Saturday, I'm I'm you know I'm leaving. Sunday or Monday and Saturday I'm going to have a nice little party in my room. Why don't you come? I said, oh, that sounds great. So I come back Saturday and, you know, I, you know, I tell the guy, hey, I'm going to room such and such. He says, do you got, what's your name? I give him my, oh, yeah, you're on the list. So I uh, take the elevator up uh, to whatever floor that was, get off, go to the room, you know, uh, hit knock on the door. Guy opens the door. And the guy goes, who are you? And David goes, Al, Al, come on in. This is my new friend, Al. And I come in, and there are all these beautiful people. I mean, beautiful people. And um, 
David goes on, he goes, I met him at Danceteria and we spent this whole unbelievable night. He showed me things I'd never seen. It was unbelievable. And, and I just love this guy. And he's I, talking about you? Yeah, he's talking about me. And so I'm like basking in the light. I still Was he talking to other people and stuff? Like and they're all the beautiful people. Anyway, I Was go he famous up, yet? Yeah, he was big by then, right? Well, yeah, 70, you know, 75. <laughs> so I go off and, you know, I'm getting some food on my little plate and a, a thing of champagne. And this woman comes over and goes, so you're really good friends with David. I <laughs> said, yeah, yeah, we're buds. He goes, you know David Bowie? <laughs> and I go, David Bowie? Yeah, that David, right there. She goes, that's David Bowie. And wow. that whole night, up until she said, that's David Bowie, I didn't know it was David Bowie. Wow. I just knew him as David. You were like hanging out in New York City like yeah. you usually do. We met, we met at uh, the, or you at used Dan's to do. Interior. We were both the odd man out at that place. And I said, you want to see something more interesting than this? And he said, yeah. Hmm. We spent that whole night together. Wow, that is amazing. Yep. So, he was so cool back then. And, no, but it's cool all the time now. Meaning, all you have to do is be open to the expanse of the experience. Those experiences are going, meaning nothing's in it. It's and like talk to people. Days. And talk to people and be more social yeah, in, in those and places. And be open to anything yeah. to go on, yeah. to open yourself, to offer yourself, to be there for the other instead of only being there for yourself. I wasn't thinking about me. I was looking at this guy who looked like he was uncomfortable, the odd man out. I wasn't I mean, I was the electrician was he, of this place. I was the dude. Was he kind of like weird and eccentric and had quirks and stuff? No, no, no. I mean, he he was, you know, the odd man out. I mean, he was not like, he didn't dress like anybody else. He dressed the way he wanted to, you know? But he had total confidence in who and what he was. Therefore, he was totally open to experience everything that we experienced. He wasn't like, oh, I can't do that. Oh. What do people got to say? Oh, they might get a picture. Oh, I beg you. Oh, oh. He didn't do any of that. <laughs> it, echoed, just, it echoed I, over there. He just like dove into the swimming pool of life. And that's why I liked him. <laughs> wow. Because he was totally open to doing, I mean, he didn't. You told me this story before and you told me other stuff that you didn't mention here. Right. Is there anything else that he did? No. That you remember? Like, didn't he, Did what did they think of him? Like. I told you, they thought, because he was going on about how this was art, you know, them throwing the pinballs and the girls in the roller skates and scantily glad on top of a, huh. a, a elevator huh. parking. I mean, it was the out, it wasn't an indoor space. It was, an, you know, on top of a roof. Wow. You know, it had covers if it had rained, but it was, you know, warmish. It was like 70 degrees that evening, or I don't, can't tell you exactly what date it was, but um, no, uh, he, <laughs> and, and what was amazing, <laughs> what I was most amazed at was watching him talk to the mobsters about culture, aesthetics, and art. And these guys were right with him. And I, uh, wow, that is amazing. Yeah. I mean, they weren't like, oh, I don't know what he thought. They were like, yeah, I know what you, yeah, I could see that. Yeah. I mean, these guys were no dummies. The mobsters. Yeah, they uh, weren't? No. Wow. They were like... They were smart? And not only smart, they were sensitive to the aesthetic thing of art. Wow, unbelievable. Yeah. You know, they were talking about, you know, lots of uh, aesthetic... You know, they were talking about the aesthetics of what this whole thing was. It wasn't just them trying to hit guys with, with the, the ball and... and Ogle the girls uh, as they and act like an like a sort of slow, big, dumb person that hurts they people. Yeah, no, they were they like weren't. kind of genius in their own way, yeah. sort of. Yeah, but they were put in that situation by family. What was that? And, and uh, all the rest. Black Cat is having. Oh, oh okay. And um, and that David Bowie and these mobsters could combine and have an amazing conversation and and um, connect with each other without any judgment or any kind of um, social strata fighting. It was, it was quite amazing. Plus there was a lot of booze and um, lamb's breath involved. So it was, it was one of those That's amazing. Things.
did he was he interested in any women or even men? Like, what was he interested? He was interested in the aesthetic of juxtaposition of everything going hmm. on. Okay. And he was also really <coughs> into time. He was like really, really, really blown away because he was just reading um, um, certain, you know, Einstein and a few other things in physics, um, Tesla and Steinmetz. And the fact that I was really a, a total Steinmetz and Tesla freak and the other physicists of that time, that's really more, he was talking more about time and how oh, cool. time wasn't linear. How time was just like, he said, just like, you know, there are people, because you could hear, almost feel when people would drive in and a car would be lifted up and moved over the whole, because you were on top of this kind of rickety metal box. Wow. And, and the control thing was right over there, so they were like 1920s relays. So it was like very Frankenstein, you know, <coughs> sparks. <coughs> and he was wow. like totally um, tripping on all of that. And I think he had just done Man Who Fell to Earth. Or he wow. was about to do Man Who Fell to Earth. How did he, and that's coincidental that he fell to Earth that day. And yeah. How, yeah, that's the cheesiest thing anyone could say. And um, how did he just show up there? Like, why did he show he up? He was listening to, we both, our crossroads was the uh, Danceteria. Oh. In um, 20 something uh, Street and 6th Avenue uh. in Manhattan. And yeah. like I said, that place had many layers of music because it had six floors or about six floors. And, you know, one was the, way, the big bar and the disco music. The next one was uh, punk music. The next one was rap and hip hop. And, and he was at one of those clubs and you hung out at those clubs I and was did the electrician. The electricity I was the electrician. For, the I would make a nightly. Yeah. Hey, is everything okay? Is not everything working? I mean, and that's how I got paid three or four hundred bucks for, per each club. Every night I would show up and say, "What's you know?" I and if something, I'd make my little list of things to fix during the week. And yeah. um, it was just happened to be one of the nights I I dropped by there to make my uh, you know weekly uh, visit, or mm. uh, and he was there, and he and and was in the floor where the music was um, experimental performance art and he wow. came to see that cool and he was leaning against the wall there was hardly anybody in this thing everyone was either in the disco thing or the rap thing or the or the punk thing and maybe 30 40 50 people were on that floor and he was just leaning against this wall and he was kind of close to the performance space, so the, instead of being in the dark, he was kind of being illuminated, and he dressed so differently. Oh, I wish. And I he was comfortable. Ralph Lauren. He looked like Ralph Lauren. Wow, that is amazing. And um, so I'm like, hmm, I got to go talk to this guy. So we started talking, and after you know, 10, 15 minutes, I said, so, what do you think of this? And he goes, eh. And I said, you want to see something even something really more interesting and he said yeah sure i'm up for it like i said it was about 11 o'clock wasn't too late and we went out you know walked to fifth avenue straight down which was from 20 something street to union square was about 10 15 blocks and we had an interesting you know so what are you interested in and he was talking about art i'm an artist i'm talking about the kind of thing oh you know that guy we started doing that whole thing and um we both realized we knew Andy Warhol, and um, but I never. You had really met twigged. Andy War. You had never what? We both knew Andy Warhol. When did you meet Andy Warhol? When I was 16. You did? Yeah, yeah. He had this thing called the Factory. Um, you you on, told a long time ago. You told me something about Union it, but Square. it was like. And uh, that's right around 14th Street, and again right over here this factory was like near 16th street and over here was an electric supply house that okay. i used to get stuff from and i'm in there talking to the guy who owns the place and this guy comes in this is the andy warhol story yeah yeah and this guy comes in okay and goes, can we make that another video sure hey
Hey, how's it going? This is John Birmingham, and if you want to see more videos on Al, on spirituality, how he met other people like Jimi Hendrix, there's going to be a new one on how he met Andy Warhol, you can click here. And those are all Al's videos. He's a psychologist and sociocultural anthropologist. And here you can just go to my channel and check out more videos and please like the video if you like the story about how he met David Bowie. Check out more of my films and have a nice, excellent day. Okay, bye.